Hello and welcome to the Faith and Culture Show. I'm Catherine Camp, your hostess for the show. Today, I have an incredible guest. William J. Federer is a well-known historian. He is a nationally known speaker, best-selling author, and president of AmeriSearch, Inc., which is a publishing company dedicated to researching America's noble heritage. Bill's American Minute Radio is broadcast daily across America and by the internet. His Faith in History television airs on the TCT network on stations across America and via DirecTV. He has been quoted on many solid publications. Bill's first book, America's God and Country Encyclopedia of Quotations, has sold over half a million copies. His works, which have been quoted by authors, politicians, leaders, journalists, teachers, even in court cases. Bill has spoken across America at events from Mount Rushmore to the Lincoln Memorial to the U.S. Capitol. This is to name but a fraction of his appearances across this great country of ours. I would like to bring on Mr. William Federer. Thank you so much for being with us today, Bill. I really appreciate it. Uh, you accepting this invitation. Well, Catherine, great to be with you. Um, I think for those people, the, the, the population who does not know you, I would think that most people know who you are, but I am aware that that there's so much out in this world right now happening that not everyone has been paying attention to history, which I think uh, maybe we need to get back to that. Um, could you please just tell us a little bit about how God led you into really this this desire to write about history. Well, thank you. Um, and we I grew up with history. My dad was an uh, attorney historian, and we had a library in our house. And every vacation, we'd go to French Fort and Spanish Fort and Indian Reservation and Kit Carson and uh, Medicine Hat and Pea Ridge Battlefields and all kinds of things. And uh, but really, wasn't till I uh, became a Christian as an adult, that it was like turning the corner on a cornfield and you see the rows line up. So it's the same corn, but from one angle, it just looks random. But from another angle, it has these nice, neat rows. History from a secular perspective, it's just a bunch of dates and numbers. And But when you see it from God's providential perspective, there's a plan. Freedom spread so that man can be what God made them to be and that you can love God voluntarily, uh, freedom of conscience versus uh, saying outwardly, that you believe because you don't want to be burnt at the stake. William Penn, who spent a time in the Tower of London as a prisoner, he said, force makes hypocrites. Tis persuasion only that makes converts. That's why one of the founding principles of America was freedom of conscience, that we don't want the government forcing people to abandon their views to fit in with some government uh, viewpoint. And now we're seeing that play out again with uh, alternative uh, sexual agendas being forced by the government and people that don't go along with it end up getting canceled and uh, all kinds of things. So it, one of these things that you learn from history is people say history repeats itself. Really human nature repeats itself. And the only variables throughout history are with technological advancements, governments can track and try to control more people. And with military advancements, kings can kill more people. <laughs> but it's that same fallen nature all the way back to the beginning of Cain, Kill, and Abel. Um, and, and so these patterns uh, are observable. And when you view the cornfield from a certain perspective, it makes sense. When you view history from a certain perspective, you begin to be able to see these patterns and make sense out of it. That is incredibly well said obviously you've been doing this a lot longer than most people what has happened this is what's disturbing to me i did not realize uh, that history of our country has been so distorted that it doesn't even resemble the truth anymore and and the young people smart smart young people coming out of uh, colleges all over the country really believe that this country needs to go towards socialism because they have failed at everything else. And I just, to me, that was mind blowing when I started to realize that a few years ago. What, 
what has happened and how can how can people who see what you're saying is the right way and and see and know our history i guess is what i'm trying to say how can we approach these people because it's almost as if they've been brainwashed right even people like Bill Maher said, gee, when I was growing up, a liberal was somebody that didn't want the government to tell them what to do. And now the liberals want the government to tell them what to do. It's like, so there's a relatively recent change. Uh, if you zoom out, one of the projects I took on was researching every single century of recorded human history to find out what the most common form of government is. And so writing, according to most archaeologists, uh, writing was invented uh, around three or 4,000 BC. Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamian Valley. Today, that's Iraq. And then you had uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics invented around 3000 BC and Chinese characters invented by the Yellow Emperor uh, around 2600 BC. And, uh, and as you go back and look at these records, they show the most common form of government is what? It's, it's basically gangs and, and a gang leader with enough weapons we call a king or a Pharaoh, or a Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar. The, the name changes, but power wants to concentrate into the hands of one person. So the first invention ever was the plow. Cain was a tiller of the soil, right, in the Bible account. And then people started hitting, hitting each other with him and they turned into weapons. And then people gravitated together for protection. And when you get people together, somebody knows how to fight a little better than the rest. And everyone says, you be our captain. You fight, you win, that's a good thing. And then this captain has kids and grandkids and everybody wants to be friends with this family and you want to butter up to them. And before you know it, they become a political family and you want to advance in the city. You got to be on their good side. And if you're taking them on as an enemy, guess what? They want to kick you out, ostracize you and even kill you. And so a, a gang leader with enough weapons, we call a king and it's a hierarchical system. If you are friends with the king, you are more equal. If you are not friends with the king, you are less equal. And if you're an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason. Or you're a slave. And that's the norm. And these kingdoms keep getting bigger because with military advancements, the kings can kill more people. So instead of Cain killing Abel with a rock, then they could kill with bronze weapons and then iron weapons and then phalanx spears, these big long spears that Alexander the Great's men had. And um, you had scimitar swords and composite bows and stirrups and uh, gunpowder the Chinese invented. The weapon improves, but it's that same fallen nature of Cain, Kill, and Abel. And these kingdoms keep getting bigger. And again, with technological advancements, kings can track more people. So somewhere around 2 BC, Augustus Caesar wanted to have a worldwide tracking system. It was called the census a tax enrollment. If, if he could have had access to 5G and cell phones and facial recognition software, I believe he would have been tempted to want to use that to track people. And so these kingdoms keep getting bigger and bigger. And um, anybody that can plot on a graph sees that at some point it's going to max out on a global level. And Jesus says, wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. And so every generation you, you've witnessed this phenomenon. Uh, but at the time of America's founding, the King of England had the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen. The King of England was a globalist. He was a one world government guy with him at the top. The sun never set on the British Empire. He had India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, Barbados, Bermuda, Jamaica, and America. And America's founders decided they didn't like a globalist king telling us what to do. And they broke away and flipped it and made the people the king. So America is an experiment of a polarity change in the flow of power. Instead of top down, ruled by the government, it's bottom up, ruled by we, the people. And the word citizen is Greek. It means co-king, co-ruler, co-sovereign. So you're a citizen of America. You are a co-ruler. You're a co-king of America. And so uh, anyway, when, when you begin to tell this history and show people how unique America is, that you get to be in charge of your life and all of us together are in charge of the country and the politicians are our servants, not our masters. Then we begin to see how unique America is. Yes, we're made up of humans that make mistakes, but when you see the big picture, it's an empowerment of the individual versus an empowerment of the state. I think people have forgotten this. I think people don't realize that we are 
supposed to be co-rulers here. Most people just hear politicians say something and then that they just go along with it. And to me, that's frustrating. And I, I think I started to recognize that things were happening by force and it didn't matter what the people said was when their the, the marriage amendment or the uh, yeah marriage laws were trying to be changed. And I remember most people in all, states across the country uh, were voting, no, we don't want to change the definition of marriage between a man and a woman. And the people in power if, up in DC didn't like that. And I know you remember this, it wasn't that long ago. So they just decided to take it to the courts and overrule what the people wanted. Uh, and I don't, I don't understand how we have gotten so far away from the idea of no, they work for us. The, uh, we don't work for the politicians. What's happened here? Yeah, it's interesting. When Obama was running for president, there was not one Democrat or Republican that was openly for gay marriage. Not one. And then he gets in and he has this change. His views evolve. And he says, oh, I just decided that I'm for gay marriage. And if you don't go along with it, you're an enemy of the state. And he purges the military of anybody that doesn't go along with it. So all of the people with old traditional Bible values are being pushed out. Right. They, they've long, long since been gone. Um, then they go through the government administration and all the departments and then it works its way down. And then they they sold it as. We don't want to tell people what to do in their bedroom. It's like, OK, if two guys want to do so, fine. As soon as it, it passes, they make a beeline for the preschool and begin indoctrinating little kids. And it's like, whoa, if they would have ran on that saying we want to indoctrinate little kids, it would never pass never gotten through. Um, but then they do a bait and switch. And then it just it's all of a sudden catapulted from gay to, to trans. It's mm -hmm. like, where did this come from? I mean, it's not even in the dictionary, uh, these different words they're coming up with. And so uh, it's, you know, water goes down a drain slow around the edges, but as it gets closer to the middle, it goes faster and faster until it's sucked down this vortex. <laughs> and so you look at history, uh, power concentrates slowly. And then it gets faster and faster on an exponential curve. You know, there was um, uh, uh, Jefferson and he approved the uh, Louisiana Purchase before it was approved by the Senate, basically. It was such a good deal. Three cents an acre, double the size of the country. Uh, and then you actually had Massachusetts wanting to secede from the Union because it thought that the, this was too big of an addition to our country and that Massachusetts would lose its percentage of influence over the government with all these new states coming in. And, but it, it passed and everybody says, hey, it's a good thing, right? Double the size of the country. And then Lincoln, it was good that he got rid of slavery, but in the process, he had a lot of rights go from the states to the federal government. He suspended habeas corpus where you can, you know, arrest somebody with under accusations. And then uh, he arrested the Maryland legislature and, and, and I mean, different things, but it was good because he wanted to get rid of slavery. But we see this concentrating of power that has, has not gone back. And then it was good that, uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson wanted to get us through World War I, but then it needed funding and pushed through the income tax. And it was like, OK. And, and then it was good that FDR wanted to get us through the Depression. But he concentrates power with all of his New Deal programs. And, and then it was, you know, uh, Lyndon Johnson wanted to get rid of poverty. And so he has his war on poverty. But in the process, he institutes a great society welfare state, right? Concentrates more power into the federal government. And then Nixon, right? He wanted to get rid of uh, drugs. And so he had his drug czar and he concentrates more power. And then Bush, right? After 9-11, we want to make sure no more terrorist attacks. And so he authorizes the NSA. And they hopscotch. So now instead of monitoring foreign correspondents, they can monitor everybody in the country. And so you, you see that there's usually a good reason, but the net result is power is concentrating into fewer and fewer and fewer hands. In 2016, President Obama pushed through the Countering Foreign Propaganda and Influence Act, right? So it allowed the federal government to monitor all of the media in America all the uh, social media and, and all the news sites and all the websites that Obama made it so the government can now monitor and control this for the sake of national security. And um, 
And so we see there's a concentrating of power. Usually it's um, after a crisis. And so it brings up the question of uh, was the crisis uh, intentional or were they just capitalizing on it? So I wrote a book called The History of Socialism from Plato to the Present. And I, and I highlight this trend of how power goes from the people to the government. And it's usually in times of crises. And I, <laughs> I never suspected that before until the last five years. You know, are the crises formulated so that they can grab a little bit more power? And I know that there are some people that really believe that and have uh, ways to back up their thoughts and their ways of thinking. So I, I'm glad you brought that up because that is, something to think about actually uh, you know are these manu I've seen I, I feel like a lot of these things that have happened just recently have been manufactured uh, I don't know how you see it as a historian uh, and as a Christian but uh, I've seen in my lifetime I've seen more and more you know God is now pretty much out of the public square has been I think, People are beginning to speak up, but they're trying to wet their toes in it, but it's not enough. Uh, how do you, what is your, what are your thoughts about, are they manufacturing some of these crises? Yeah, so in my book called Socialism, The Real History from Plato to the Present, I highlight how the most common form of government is kings and democracies and republics are attempts to take the power of the king and give it to the people. Now, democracy, demos means people, krasi means rule. And so in the city of Athens, you had 6,000 citizens and, uh, and they ruled themselves. But every citizen had to be at every meeting every day to talk about every issue, right? You would called out of your home to the Agora marketplace and you deliberated very time consuming. You, you literally didn't have time for anything else in, in Athens. And if you didn't keep up with what was being talked about today, you were called an idiotus, <laughs> an idiot. It's like, what are we talking about today? Oh, you don't know. <laughs> now a Republic is a little different. A Republic is where you take care of your family and your farm and you have someone in your place that goes to the market every day and talks politics. They are your representative. An easy way to remember is the word Republic begins with three letters REP and the word representative begins with three letters REP. So a Republican form of government is representative. So you're still in charge. You're just subcontracting out for somebody else to go there and listen to all what's being talked about. And, um, and so if republics and democracies are attempts to take the power of the king and separate it and give it to the people, like take the Tower of Babel and scatter it, what if the king wants the power back? Does he just ask for it? I, I want to be king. Give me control of your life. Most mm -hmm. people aren't in a hurry to give that up. So there's two methods. Fear. When you get people into fear, they'll panic and surrender their freedom for security. Like when, you know, people started to turn the plow into a weapon, hitting each other, then they go to some captain and say, hey, you help us. Right? But also it's free stuff. And it's like a drug dealer takes over a neighborhood two ways. He can come in with guns, shoot and get people into fear. And they all submit to the mob and pay mm -hmm. extortion protection money. Or the drug dealer's so nice, he's giving away free drugs until you get hooked. And then you want some more free drugs, you're going to have to sell yourself into prostitution, right? And so a hunter catches animals through guns or bait. So guns is the front door and bait is the back door. There's a couple of scriptures. Uh, you know, there's um, the fear of man bringeth a snare, right? Snare is a trap. And, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, every man, when he is drawn away of his own lusts, he's enticed and then he's trapped. And, and so... Uh, so let's talk about these two methods, fear and free stuff, to get people to give up their freedom. Um, you have uh, uh, the, to get people into fear, there has to be an unsettledness. There has to be an insecurity. There has to be something that's, that's and so when everything's fine, I'm not in fear. I don't want to give up my free stuff, or, you know, my, my, my freedoms. Mm -hmm. And so you have to create this atmosphere of fear. And how do you do that? You sow discord. So the name devil in Greek 
diabolos means to divide, like, uh, right? Uh, and so imagine being in heaven and somebody sowing division, discord. It happened. Lucifer, right? Got a third of the angels to divide and separate, and they're cast out. And then the devil sows discord in the garden with Adam, Blame, and Eve, and Cain, Kill, and Abel. And then there's an interesting story. For 400 years, Israel was a republic. I get into it a lot in my books, how this was a unique period from 1400 BC to around 1000 BC, where you had millions of people and no king. So ancient Israel is, is literally the first instance in world history of millions of people, no king. It worked because every citizen was taught the law and they were personally accountable to God to follow the law. So mm -hmm. you're about to steal, nobody's around, you know you can get away with it, and then you think God's watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable in the future. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. And it creates something in your head called a conscience. If everybody in the country believes this, you can maintain complete order with no police. And so this was the Hebrew Republic. There's 400 year period, no king. And, um, and so uh, it was this period that um, uh, you called the Hebrew Republic that America's founders modeled America after. That's why they taught Hebrew at Yale and Harvard. Okay. So to this day, uh, Yale has its, on its coat of arms, the Hebrew letters uh, standing for truth and light. Um, and so, um, and so, so Israel was unique, uh, but uh, what happened toward the end of their period, the priests stopped teaching the law and every man did what was right in their own eyes, turns into chaos and they end up, going to Samuel and they say, we want to be like the other countries. We, we want a king. Yeah. So during this Hebrew Republic period, there's a story of Gideon and he defeats a hundred thousand Midianites. I mean, there is no nation even thinking about invading Israel. They just defeated a hundred thousand Midianites. There's peace. But Gideon has an illegitimate son named Abimelech and he wants power. So he goes to the town of Shechem, where his mom was from. And um, she was, I guess, a concubine to Gideon. And he goes to this town and he says, he does critical race theory. He does identity race politics. He says, is it better for you that the sons of Gideon reign over you? Remember also that I am your flesh and your bone. And the men of Shechem said to each other, well, we got to support him because he is our brother. And then they go to the city treasury, the temple of Balbarith, and they take money to hire rioters, protesters. And they gave him 10 score, three, three score and 10 pieces of silver out of the house of Balbarith, where with Abimelech hired vain and worthless persons which followed him. Rioters. And what did they do? They did violence. They went into his father's house at Ophrah and they slew all of his half brothers, the sons of Gideon. And, and then the Menashech made of him like king. So you take a country completely at peace, but on the inside, somebody wants power and he sows this division so that there can be confusion pitting against each other. And then he seizes power. And so this model of going into a country and creating a crisis, creating division intentionally. And um, so you see this theme occurring throughout history. Uh, one is Italy 500 years ago had city-states, Venice, Genoa, Naples, Florence, Siena, and they all fought. And Machiavelli thought if one prince could control all of Italy, it would stop the infighting between these city-states. So his end was good. And so he writes a book called The Prince, where he advocates the ends justifies the means. The end of one prince controlling all of Italy is such a good end because it'll stop this infighting that any means necessary to get there is justified. Light, cheat, steal. So if a prince conquers a city and the city does not want to be conquered, they would hate him. But if the prince pays criminals, like Abimelech did, to burn barns, kill cows, create terror, the people will panic and cry out for help. And some prince will come in and get rid of the very criminals he bribed to create the mess. Nobody will know the better for it. And everybody will praise the prince as the hero for saving them. So it's good marketing. You create the need and fill it. You go around the back of the house and set it on fire. And then you go around the front of the house and sell them a fire extinguisher. And they'll pay anything for it and even thank you for being there. So it's called Machiavellianism, where you create or capitalize on a crisis to consolidate control. I feel like that's what we've been through recently. And maybe even 9-11. I'm beginning to wonder about that. 
but definitely recently. I, and I, um, I, I did see that, uh, that there was, because it was, it's interesting because when I was writing a newsletter, when I was writing a blog, I thought, what, why would people give up their rights as, as free people in, in this country of the United States? Something would have to happen. It would, somebody would have to come in and create so much division and so much chaos that people would just not know where to turn and they would turn to the government to help them. Uh, and obviously instead of God, but uh, just exactly what you're saying. So this is historically proven. Yeah, another uh, chapter is about 200 years ago, uh, Germany was not Germany, it was a bunch of kingdoms. You had Saxony, Bavaria, Prussia, and they had armies and fought. And Napoleon had just killed 6 million people across Europe in the Napoleonic Wars. And so the king of Prussia said, we can't get conquered that easy again. We need to strengthen our state. And so he has a philosopher at the University of Berlin named Hegel. You know him because he had a student named Karl Marx. And Hegel came up with something called dialectics. It's a triangle. One corner is a thesis. The opposite corner is an antithesis or antithesis. And the top corner is a synthesis. It sounds complicated, but it's not. You start off at the first corner, the status quo. You create the antithesis. You create a crisis. You create a problem that's real bad and gets everybody to panic and fear. And then they'll surrender some of their freedoms to settle for a synthesis, an answer that's just half as bad. And so Karl Marx took this and says, okay, um, then that becomes the new thesis starting point. You create another crisis that's real bad. Everybody panics and fears, surrenders some more of their freedom to settle for an answer that's just half as bad. And then that becomes a new starting point. You create another problem that's real bad. Everybody panics and fear, gives up some more of their freedom to settle for an answer that's half as bad. And every time they settle, they give up a little of their freedom to the state. And so Karl Marx says, well, how do you create a problem that's real bad? You have to send in agitators, agent provocateurs, community organizers, labor organizers. Their job is to find people with grievances and stir them up to riot. And he called it critical theory. So you go into a country and you observe all the groups. At first, it was economic, the proletariat versus the bourgeois, the working class against the business owners. And then it was racial, right? A black against the white or Bosnians against the Serbs or whatever. And then it was um, uh, uh, religious, right? The, the Sunni, the Shia, the Orthodox. And it, it didn't matter. But you would categorize everybody in the country as victims or oppressors, haves and have nots. And then you would stir up crises against them, like Abimelech did, like Machiavelli. You'd, you'd find some uh, injustices and you'd fan them, and then it would break out into violence and bloodshed, and you would co-opt the media, right, to blame the leader of the country. And then when the leader's popularity fell, then you'd replace the leader with a Soviet puppet. And so this happened during the Cold War. The KGB did it, and then the CIA would copy it. And for 70 years, these tactics have been perfected. Right. So if it was a country that had a republic, the KGB would come in, do critical theory, observe all the groups, call some victims, others oppressors, and they would pit them against each other, destabilize the country, and then they would seize power. And then the, the CIA would do it in reverse. And uh, Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, approved uh, Operation Ajax, um, where uh, the head of Iran, Mazadek, was beginning to side with the Soviet Union. And we didn't like that. And so he sends in Kermit Roosevelt Jr., the grandson of Teddy Roosevelt. And he goes over to Tehran. He's an expert in foreign languages. And he recruits gangsters and mobsters and radical imams. And he stages protests and riots and they attack mosques. And then they co-opt the media to blame Mossadegh for all the disruption and problems. And he drops in popularity. They do a coup, put him under house arrest and replace him with the Shah. And the Shah loved America because we all put him in until Jimmy Carter pulled the rug and turned it all over to the Ayatollah. But, but these tactics have been perfected for 70 years. And under Obama, they began to be co-opted and used on American soil against us politically. Sort of like the IRS was co-opted. So Obama met with Lois Lerner, one of the heads of the IRS, 147 times. And at the same time, she turns the IRS to target conservative groups. 
And when she's called to testify, she just pleads the fifth and walks out, basically admitting that she's <laughs> she doesn't want to incriminate herself by admitting what happened. And so um, anyway, uh, we've seen this happen with the um, intelligence gathering communities and all the other federal agencies. Having a coughing fit. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm just surprised a lot more. More people do not see this and what's happening, and has been happening. Um, I blame a lot of that on our mainstream media outlets. Um, now you are a big researcher. You know a lot of history, um, and you did mention you know you take over the media. Is it, um, is it true, uh, and you may not even know this answer, that all of the media in the world is owned by maybe six corporations, which means six people at the top? Yeah, and then you add to that BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, these asset management companies that are called index funds, but um, they manage people's retirements. But you're not going to go to a Exxon stockholder meeting. I mean, you're busy. You got, and so you check the proxy box. And so these index funds, these asset management companies, show up at the stockholder meeting with thousands and thousands of proxy votes. So many that they basically dictate the meeting. And they've co opted all these corporations. And now they're controlling trillions of dollars. So we always thought that Pepsi and Coke were competitors. We'll go to Google, look up who owns the stock. It's BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. Um, we always thought that General Mills and Nestle's were competitors. Well, who owns their stock? BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. Media companies, transportation companies, food processing companies, all these companies. And they estimate that, you know, by two, 2028, BlackRock will own everything in the world. I mean, it's got it is so powerful that if they, you know, buy a stock, it'll go up. But if they decide to sell it, it craters, right? So it's and so um, you see the media. Uh, but uh, one of the studies I did, and it's in the book called Socialism, uh, The Real History from Plato to the Present. But uh, in the 1800s, it was marketing. And you had Wells Fargo Wagon and Sears Catalog. And they would list every detail about a sewing machine. And you would make an informed purchase. But then in the early 1900s, you had... Edward Bernays, and he pioneered modern marketing, and he was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, the psychoanalyst, and he basically found out that we are group creatures, humans. We want to be accepted. We do not want to be rejected. Pretty simple, but that's how it's all based on. And so he would do these marketing campaigns where they would say nothing about a product. They would just make it look like everybody's using it. And everybody would say, well, everybody's using it. I want to use it. Uh, one was Crisco. Nobody knew what was in Crisco. They actually invented a term, vegetable-based. And they had a marketing campaign that made it look like everybody was using it. It was so successful, it put out of business the lard industry. They would make soap and stuff out of lard. And, but, it's, uh, and, um, but you know what Crisco's made out of? It's cottonseed oil. The deep south, they'd harvest cotton, have mountains of these black seeds. Nobody wanted. Well, uh, they would mush them and put them into machine oil for factories. Nobody ate that stuff, but somebody decided to bleach it with these nice ad campaigns. We've all eaten it uh, called industrial seed oil. And, um, and another Edward Bernays talked about women's shoes. He said, women go into a department store and think they're picking out shoes. They're not. The shoes were picked out for them by the marketing executive who paid the actors to put them on, who paid the photographer to take the pictures, who paid to put it in that magazines, the women see it in the magazines and want it. It was this way women are controlled in this area of their private lives by these marketing executives. And he says, you just simply apply that to politics. And so we are a country of government from the consent of the governed. It's right. listed in our Declaration of Independence. So Edward Bernays wrote a book called The Engineering of Consent. So you take all this marketing, which is designed to do what? Sway people to buy a product and you flip it all over and you sway people ideologically, politically. Mm -hmm. You make it look like everybody's going along with it. And now it's done through the internet. 
they cancel voices that don't go along with it and they magnify the voices that do and everybody looks on the internet well gee it looks like everybody is voting for this candidate uh, I guess I want to too and this everybody thinks this other candidate is bad and I don't want to you know be seen supporting this one um, they've actually done studies on this and um, but uh, I can share some of those if you like yes that would be fine I'm I'm you know entranced by everything you're saying <laughs> because it's just all truth and and yes I, I think many of us have been uh, part of that silenced voice out there uh, because it just doesn't go along with the narrative that they need to maintain power. Um, but I really want to see that that shield broken. But yes, please tell us. Yeah, so after World War II, they were wondering, were all the Germans bad? And then they realized, well, no, they were just going along with the group. So Joseph Goebbels had read Edward Bernays and Goebbels was the Nazi minister of propaganda. And he orchestrated these Coliseum events with 100,000 people. And they would begin to give the Hitler salute in the front. And it would work its way back like a wave at a football game. And everybody would see everybody else getting it would be closer and closer. Then, then you'd, you'd give it, and people would see you give it, they'd feel pressure to give it. And then they would leave the theater, right? This big uh, Coliseum. And they'd say, well, everybody's going along with this. I guess I'm going to go along with it. Nobody wants to be the one person that's not going to lift their hand, right? And so this manipulation of your perception of what the group is going along with, it's the same. We're, we're social beings. So a water molecule is individual, but you put it with other water mo molecules and they operate as a group, like with clouds and waves on an ocean. A uh, fish in a bowl is individual, but you put it with other fish, they operate in a group, they can turn on a dime. Bird in a cage, put it with other birds, they operate in a group, right? In the sky, they can swim. Well, we're individuals, but you put us with other individuals and we operate as a group. We're constantly giving and receiving feedback. Are we being accepted or rejected? And now they're manipulating that. Uh, and so you, uh, so after World War II, uh, one of the studies was called the Solomon Ash Conformity Experiment. And they did it on college campuses. And they would pull eight students into a classroom. Seven had been paid ahead of time to be actors. And one was a naive participant. And the teacher would put two cards on the front desk. One card had one line. And the other card had three lines, one longer, one shorter, one the same. And beginning with the paid actors, one by one, they would convincingly say that the shorter line was equal to the first line. By the time it got around to that eighth naive participant, 30% of them would deny their own eyes to fit in with the group. They're looking at the lines. They can see they're not equal. But they begin to doubt their perception. They would wonder, well, these other people, they seem to be upper class, but they seem to know what they're talking about. I'm going to go along with them. And uh, now if only one person disagreed, it went from 30% down to 5%. And then there, Chuck Colson talked about a wine tasting experiment they did where everybody was in on it except one naive couple. And they poured vinegar in the wine. And this couple wrote on their little card, this tastes terrible. But then as they went around the room, all the other couples would say, oh, we liked that wine. It was good, it had character, it was robust. And this couple scratched out what they wrote and they stood up in it and said, oh, yeah, we, we think it was a nice tasting wine. They agreed with the group. And then when someone said, well, you know, all they did was pour vinegar in there, right? They poured vinegar in the wine. Um, this couple criticized the people for saying that they poured vinegar in the wine. And it's a phenomenon called false enforcement. Once people buy into the lie, they will help enforce that other people buy into the lie. It's like, you know, molecules that line up. It's like a, a polarity that changes. And it's like, I don't know why I'm wearing this thing on my face, but I'm going to pull out my camera and I'm going to record somebody else that's walking around not wearing it. And it's like, I'm going to help enforce this. And um, and so this desire to fit in with the group is powerful. And um, they did one after the group. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think it's too powerful. Uh, we saw that happen recently with the, uh, the C-19 injections uh, that everyone was looking at those who were hesitant because it is something new and genetic altering, then they were made to look like the bad guys, like 
so I think what you're explaining, we've recently seen in, in real time. Um, yeah, I, I, I've wondered why people are that way. And it's, it's kind of scary because when it comes to faith in God, that the same thing seems to happen to young people who go off to college, who are not solid in their faith. Uh, and because you are a Christian, I'm sure that you recognize some of that as well. Um, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, in the classroom, it's called social emotional learning. And it's weaponizing peer pressure. That all these kids want to be accepted. They don't want to be rejected. And they have what's called the pyramid of oppression. At the top are the cisgendered. That's what they call people who believe there is a male and a female, cisgendered. They're the oppressors. Everybody else down the pyramid is being oppressed by the oppressors, the transsexual, bisexual, asexual, anything sexual. And they go to these little kids, which one do you want to be? They're like, well, I, I, I certainly don't want to be the bad oppressor at the top, so I'll pick one of these others. They've had one article was 991% increase in trans identifying children in the last two years under yeah. Biden. It works. They've studied child psychology the same way that they've studied marketing for Disney, for example. They push billions of dollars worth of merchandise, Disney pajamas, Disney lunch boxes, Disney Band-Aids, Disney little figures at McDonald's. I mean, everything. And it's billions of dollars. And what's it all based on? Getting a little kid to want something. The, the ability to uh, sway a little kid's mind. Well, they've taken swaying mind to, to buy a frozen, you know, uh, pajama to now it's they're swaying their minds in the classroom with social emotional learning and making these, if a kid says they believe in old values, it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's like first day of class, uh, teacher says, who believes that it's normal to have a mommy and a daddy? And little Johnny raises his hand. And the teacher says, you're a terrible kid. You're an awful kid. You're a worse kid. No, you're a homophobe. You're a big, you're just bad, bad, bad. And, and he shrinks in his desk. And then the teacher stops and says, does anybody else believe what little Johnny does? Are you going <laughs> to raise your hand? All right. And so Saul Linsky said the most powerful weapon is ridicule. You shame them in front of their classmates. Everybody backs away from them and everything they stand for. And then the teachers has some other kid that uh, uh, embraces the approved views and she brings them to the front, puts a star on their chest and then they're there and, and it works. And so mm -hmm. they're using this social emotional learning to push this trans agenda on these little innocent kids. And now we're having detransitioners where these people are coming out and says, I was manipulated into getting these surgeries and now I'm waking up as an adult and I've realized that I'm, I'm, I'm irre, you know, can't go back. And so, right. uh, so another study they did on group think is the Korean war. So after world war II, we rescued the prisoners and they loved America and kissed the ground and great to be back. They rescued the Korean war prisoners and they hated America. It's like, what happened to these guys? And so they did a study. They found out that the Koreans did something called brainwashing. That's where that term came from, right? It was from the 1950s. And it was a take on the Buddhist concept of cleansing the mind, right? The meditating and cleansing. It's an emotional reset. So they would take these prisoners and isolate them. And they would get for weeks and months and they would get vulnerable. They would just crave wanting to get back, to, wanting to communicate with another human, right? Wanting to have a buddy and a slap on the back. And, and when they were in this vulnerable emotional state, they would bring them into a room with a bunch of guys who had already caved. And they would say, before you could be accepted in this group, you had to repudiate America. You had to agree, America's bad, America's terrible, I hate America. And once you did that, then you got this emotional reinforcement, the slap on the back and the buddy treatment. And, and even after they were rescued, they still hated America. It like went into their subconscious. And so this idea is you take a whole country and you isolate people in their homes and you get them to the place where they're at this vulnerable spot. Like, I just want to go back to normal. I just want to go out shopping. I want to go to a restaurant again. I want to just get back to my normal routine. And they say, well, before you do, you got to get this shot. 
You got to let us track you wherever you go. You got to, you know, take away your freedom of speech because you might say, say something that sets somebody off. And, and the people are like, whatever, whatever, just, just let me get back to normal. And so they study human psychology and we are a group of people and they have manipulated that. And, uh, and it's done very effectively in the classroom. Very effectively. And uh, I, um, I'm surprised more people don't catch on um, with marketing campaigns and the whole LGBTQ um, ideology was a marketing campaign. Um, I'm, sh you, I'm sure you're familiar with David Capellian's The Marketing of Evil, um, but that was one of the first things that God had me read when he wanted me to start addressing that topic. And it was a real eye-opener, and it had me going down all kinds of paths on uh, psychological behavior, what happens to our brains, um, and, and how deep the human psychology behind it all is. And it's a shame that more people don't know it because I, I don't think they would fall for it if they understood that they were being um, lied to I think that they would just kind of either ignore it or put their foot down and say enough is enough. But uh, many people are, are tormented and they're not even allowed to get help because they, if they try to, they are ostracized by their, the only community that they have found that will accept them in those lifestyles. So it's, it's a, it's a ball of wax right now. Well, and it, it is interesting that um, they, they get accepted as long as they comply. Yes. And if they don't, then they're rejected. It's very cult-like in that manner. So cults, yeah. they'll give you emotional support as long as you're in it. But if you decide to leave it, then you're, you're a, no, a non-entity. Um, Islam does the same thing. Um, where the fundamental Muslims, if you... You're free to join, but if you want to leave, you're, the community uh, will come after you. You know, this group manipulation. Peter, the apostle, was around a, with a group around a fire. And a girl gets in Peter's face and says, you were with Jesus. And you can picture Peter looking around the fire and everybody is eyeing him. And he says, I never met the guy. It's like, that's it? You caved that you were with him for three years? You were with him a couple hours ago? You promised him? There is a real fear of being kicked out of a group. It's a real thing. Mm -hmm. But then after the resurrection, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Sanhedrin says, we gave you strict orders not to speak in this name. And Peter said, it's better to obey God rather than men. It's like, whoa, what happened to Peter? Now he doesn't care about the group. He doesn't care if he's kicked out of the synagogue. He doesn't care. It's like he's filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, Jesus had risen from the dead and was with them, all right, on and off for 40 days. And Peter was still hiding out. Only after he was filled with the Holy Spirit did he have the courage to sp stand up to the government power and, and stand up for truth. So maybe one of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit is having the courage to stand up to corrupt government. <laughs> and, and I think really we need that. We really need more people to um, be, I guess, trust God and trust the spirit of God inside of us. And I have found that not many people remind their congregations. And when I say people, I mean pastors remind their congregations that when you are born again and you are, you've are you been baptized by the Spirit, you shouldn't fear man. I mean, we're all going to fear man because they will do horrible, torturous things to us. God is just. So it will be, a, a he will issue something just for us, for our sins. And, but he's not going to, you know, torture us like uh, humans would do. I remember David was given that choice by God. Do you want you know me to leave you to what man will do to you, or, or do you want to take one of these punishments that I will give you? But as far as we are today with the Holy Spirit, I think we need to start standing up and, and not being afraid. Obviously, we have to be discerning 
and wise as to when and what we say, and where we say it. Um, timing is everything. But more Christians really need to trust that the, the Holy Spirit will give us the power and the words that we need at the right time. Because I think we're in a very dangerous place as humanity in the world. But right now, our country is being attacked like never before. And many people just don't see it or they're just willfully blind. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, yeah. In one sense, uh, I look back at history and every generation has a crisis. Attila the Hun, 450 AD, he had an army of a half a million men and he's wiping out cities across Europe, Mainz and Reims, and he's headed toward Paris and a young woman named Genevieve gets all of Paris to fast and pray. And suddenly Attila skips sacking Paris. So she's considered the patron saint of Paris. And, but we could have lived during the time of Genghis Khan. He killed 30 million people from Korea to Hungary, right? Wow. Uh, he had uh, armies of 300,000 men with this composite bow that could shoot 300 yards and, and it, the opponents couldn't even reach him. And uh, we could have lived at that time. Then you had the Spanish flu or the bubonic plague or World War One or two. There's, there's always a crisis. And it's almost like God allows the crises to force us to make a decision. Mm. Some people run to the to the need and other people run away. Um, historically, Christians have been ones to run to where the need is, like the white, white blood cells, right? Okay. And, and there's a, a, a plague or an illness. I, I was uh, speaking in, a, in Pennsylvania, and it was a, like a Mennonite type community. And um, the, the one lady I was talking to had the little bonnet on her head and had like the, you know, the blue checkered type of dress. And, and um, you know, and I was thinking, well, these are, you know, uh, sweet Christians. And, and then she talked about how she was getting ready to go over to Syria to minister to the refugees from, you know, the ISIS. And I got, it's really dangerous over there. They're like killing people. She goes, oh, we know, um, but we're going to go anyway because there's a need uh, and minister to all these refugees. And, and, and I said, well, you know, aren't you afraid of getting killed? She goes, well, they, they had us all watch a video where ISIS came into a town and they uh, were making Christians deny their faith. And they had this one guy and they had him kneeling down. They said, deny Jesus or we'll kill you. He denies Jesus. They chop off his head anyway and they chuckle. And they said they had us watch that video so that we make a decision. If we're going to go over there, we're willing to die and not, not deny Jesus. And I'm like taken back like, whoa, these are real Christians. Right. I mean, these are serious, but that's the way Christians were throughout history. Yes. Why? Go ahead. No, I was just agreeing with you. Yes. Um, people were more aware of what they had to do and, and not do for their faith. Uh, so uh, each state gets to put two statues in the U.S. Capitol Statuary Hall in Hawaii. One of their statues is Father Damien. And so the whaling ships go by Hawaii, diseases, leprosy. And it was this terrible plague in the uh, middle eight, late 1800s of Hawaiians dying of leprosy. And uh, and they would take them to Molokai, this island with one flat area on the ocean level, but then it was like a 300 foot cliff and the rest of the island on the other side. So the, the two couldn't sides wouldn't touch. And, and they dropped the lepers off there. It's a leper colony. And they wouldn't even bring the boat up to the shore because they didn't want anybody to touch it. They shoved the person with leprosy into the water and make them swim. I mean, it was just terrible. Well, Father Damien mm -hmm. comes. He's a a Catholic priest, and he goes to the leper colony, and he ministers to these people with leprosy for you know a couple decades, and he eventually dies. But he was so precious to these Hawaiians that they put his statue at the Capitol in Honolulu and in the U.S. Capitol Statuary Hall. There's a statue of Father Damien, and and so Christians were known to be people who would not think about themselves and go to where there is a need. And I sort of think that God is pushing the world today to make that decision. And so some people are going to cave and they're going to, you know, it's like a freshman chemistry class and the teacher has a beaker with a solution and pours in a catalyst that causes a reaction. And some stuff precipitates and settles to the bottom of the beaker and other stuff gets effervescent, bubbly and spills over the top of the beaker. It's like the time period that we are living in is our solution. And the crises of our time period is a catalyst and it causes a reaction. And some people's reaction is to run away and hide and deny their faith and faith and even take the mark of the beast. 
Like, how can I survive unless the government's my nanny, right? And other people's yeah. response is, okay, God, there's a crisis. Where do you need me? Yeah. Uh, there's sick people. There's hurting people. There's, you know, the, the, the innocent little boys and girls that need to be defended, right? Uh, it's like, where's the need? I'm already dead. My life is hid with Christ and God. I'm yours. Where do you want me? Mm -hmm. And um, and, and there, there's this division. And so I think that God is pulling back the curtain and he's letting evil expose itself like the Wizard of Oz, right? You're scared of Oz. And then the little Toto dog pulls back the curtain. You see this old man with a microphone, right? Mm -hmm. But God is pulling back the curtain. Never before has it been Satan clubs on elementary school campuses, Satan right. worshiping Grammys, Disney yeah. having an FX cartoon called Little Demon, uh, the daughter of Satan, um, and and you know Satan statues in the Iowa State Capitol, and Satan trans clothes designers for Target. And it's like, hello, pull back the curtain, Satan. Yeah. And then on the other side, God is having people be bolder for Jesus than ever before, and it's almost like God saying, okay. We're the bride of Christ, and every romance novel builds up to a decision-making moment, a forsaking of all others and choosing the one. And I think God is pushing the world to a decision-making moment. And some people are going to choose the all others. They're going to be social creatures. They're going to say, okay, I want to be accepted. And, and they're willing to go along. Oh, yeah, they're killing babies. They're doing that. You know. And others are like, no, I, I, I tolerated something I didn't feel good about. And then I tolerated, I stretched the rubber band and tolerated something else. But I'm sorry, I cannot go with hysterectomies on little innocent eight-year-old girls because mm -hmm. they went through a tomboy phase. I'm sorry, I can't go with castrating a little boy because he picked up his sister's doll. And they cut the rubber band and it snaps back. And they say, well, since I don't care about what people think about me anymore, I may as well be bolder for Jesus. And there's a a, a split that takes, like cell devices. It's a splitting. And I think God is pushing the world to this splitting moment. And some people are going to pick the all others. And other ones are like, okay, I, I just have to draw the line. I, I was at a event with Charlie Kirk. And he's like, I draw the line with Satan. Well, you're not tolerant. You're not, you know, that's right. I'm not going to tolerate Satan. <laughs> I draw the line at Satan. But some people are going to tolerate him. It's like, okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, the same way you're, si I'm just finishing up a new book uh, where I go through this, but the same way you're silent at a wedding ceremony and your silence gives consent to the wedding vows. Yes. Uh, if there are sins going on in the community and you're silent, you're giving consent to the sins. Yes. And, and, if, and if you give consent to sin, you're an accomplice, you're an accessory. And you share in the, the judgment. And yep. so anyway. Yep. And I, I just, where can people find all your books? Because you have so many good books. It's almost like a library that you've written on your own. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Catherine. My website is AmericanMinute.com. Okay. And you have a sub stack where people can find you? American um, Minute? Yeah. I, I mean, mostly it's... Um, from my website, I post, and then on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram, uh, things like that. Okay. All on American Minute, right? Yeah, AmericanMinute.com. Okay. Thank you so much for, for being my guest today and just filling us with so much information. I think this is one of those where people will have to watch it over and over to take notes. So thank well, you so much. Well, I, I will, if I can end with one thought, that yes. what are the stories we love best? It's where God's people are in hopeless situations and he raises up little nobodies who are small in their own eyes, but big in faith and courage. I mean, you got Moses, an 80 year old man against Pharaoh, the most powerful military leader in the world. And he's totally unarmed, right? And he stands up with his staff says, God use me. And then there's little David against this giant Goliath. And, and then there's Esther having to go into the most powerful guy in the world, risking her life, and right, or Deborah or the Apostle Paul. And, and those are all the stories we like. And imagine being in heaven and, and you're with them and they're telling all their stories. And then they look at you. So you, we haven't heard from you yet. Tell us your story. <laughs> what, what was going on on earth when you, it was your turn to be down there? What were they saying about God? And, and you, tell us how you stood up when it looked really hopeless. Right. And so this is our turn. It is our turn. Thank you for that, because many of us feel very small but we're doing everything that we're being called to do as far as we know. <laughs> Amen. Well, you're doing a great work. Thank you. And God bless you. God bless.